We've entered a new chapter in the Starship program, the era of Starship Block 3. Even though its first flight is not far away, many people still don't fully understand just how different this vehicle is. That's because Block 3 isn't just an upgrade, it's an entirely new beast. This is the true story of Starship Block 3. The B-18 accident, while unfortunate, was a setback for the program, especially as SpaceX is pushing to move fast. But for space enthusiasts and those who closely follow Starship, it also provided a rare opportunity, the first clear look inside the latest Super Heavy booster. That view revealed some fascinating details. Most notably, it showed how Super Heavy version 3 routes and manages its propellants, and why SpaceX redesigned the plumbing to make landings more reliable. First, liquid oxygen. In version 3, there is no longer a big central transfer tube running through the oxygen tank. That's because the entire outer tank itself is already full of liquid oxygen. When the valves open, the oxygen simply flows straight down into the engines through short feed paths. You can now clearly see a lot of lines going to the engines, but many of the lines are not propellant at all. They carry other things like pressurization gas, control systems, or instrumentation. Since the tank is completely full during ascent, there's no need for a dedicated oxygen pipe to the outer Raptor 3 engines. Methane is different. Liquid methane sits in the upper tank, so it still has to travel all the way down to the engine section. That's why there is a large central methane transfer tube, which SpaceX describes as large as a Falcon 9. You can say, almost like a rocket within a rocket. It's heavily reinforced because it's under extreme stress. Early in flight, the surrounding liquid oxygen is pushing inward on it, and later, once the oxygen is gone, the methane pressure pushes outward instead. On top of that, Super Heavy is designed to fly back and land gently near the launch tower, so the structure has to survive significant aerodynamic and landing loads. At the bottom of this methane tank, the flow splits into many lines that feed all 33 engines. The most unusual new feature in version 3 is the side-mounted tank. This exists to solve a landing problem. By the time Super Heavy is coming back for a tower catch, most of its propellant has already been burned. The remaining liquid oxygen in the main tank can slosh around or break up, which risks starving the engines during the final burn. To prevent that, SpaceX added a dedicated liquid oxygen header tank mounted on the side of the booster. This tank stays mostly full throughout the flight and is reserved for the final landing burn. During ascent and earlier burns, they likely draw from the main tank. After the boost back burn, valves switch over so that the inner engines are fed by the side tank instead. That way, when Super Heavy lights up its engines for the final descent and tower catch, the oxygen supply is stable, clean, and predictable. Put together with the central methane transfer tube, this design keeps both propellants well controlled right up to the moment of landing. There's one interesting question a lot of people have about the Block 3 booster. On V2, the hot staging ring sat between the ship and the booster and intentionally covered part of one side. That covered section biased the exhaust flow during staging, helping the booster reliably start its flip in a preferred direction as the ship's engines ignited. In other words, part of the flip control came from shaping how the exhaust interacted between the ship and the booster. With V3, that approach is gone. The hot stage system is now integrated directly into the booster, so there's no longer a sacrificial ring with one-sided shielding. Does that mean SpaceX has given up on controlling the flip? Well, not at all. It means they've moved the control mechanisms elsewhere and made them more subtle and structural rather than relying on a big, one-sided hole. The first big change is that engine ignition sequencing now matters more than physical shielding. The combination of Raptor vacuum and sea level Raptors on the ship, igniting in a specific order, creates an asymmetric plume environment above the booster. Even small differences in timing and thrust buildup can impart a rotational impulse, especially at staging when the vehicles are still very close together and forces couple efficiently. The second change is the rounded interstage dome geometry. The smoother dome changes how exhaust flows across it. Exhaust no longer hangs on edges as much, but instead slides and wraps. That means plume impingement can be guided by curvature instead of hard barriers. When the booster begins to peel away, the plume sweeps across the dome surface and the geometry determines where heat and force concentrate. 
This is why you now see targeted reinforcement plates on specific regions of the dome rather than uniform shielding. We got a great view of the heat map looking at the top of Booster 18. The outer patches provide general coverage, while the inner plates are strategically placed directly beneath each vacuum and sea level engine. The third factor is intentional asymmetry, and this is where the missing grid fin matters. By removing one grid fin, SpaceX is effectively biasing mass, drag, and thermal tolerance in one direction. That asymmetry works together with plume forces to favor a consistent flip direction without needing a large external structure to kick the booster. Now to the question of the offset RVAC shielding, since RVACs don't gimbal. One theory is this. While the engines themselves don't move, their exhaust absolutely does. At staging altitude, the ambient pressure is still high enough that the RVAC exhaust is underexpanded, meaning atmospheric pressure pushes the plume inward toward the vehicle centerline. When you factor in the centrally mounted sea level engines and their gimbling, the exhausts interact and behave more like a single, flexible flow field rather than separate jets. As the booster begins rotating away, this combined plume sheet sweeps across the dome. Even a non-gimbling engine can create asymmetric heating and force if its plume is being bent or redirected by nearby exhaust and vehicle motion. So instead of relying mainly on ignition timing, SpaceX can now use gimbling in a preferred direction during pullaway. That steers the combined plume so it impinges more strongly on one side of the dome, creating both thermal loading and a reaction force that helps initiate rotation. This approach is more controllable, more tunable, and doesn't require a disposable structure. V3 doesn't abandon flip control at staging. It replaces a blunt mechanical solution with a more elegant combination of plume physics, vehicle geometry, gimbling strategy, and deliberate asymmetry. Moving on to the upper stage, unlike the booster, where many changes are obvious both externally and internally, the outside of the Starship upper stage may look familiar compared to earlier versions. But don't let that fool you. Beneath the surface, it's also been completely overhauled. One of the most noticeable updates is the addition of external docking adapters. These twin ports closely resemble those shown on SpaceX's orbital refueling graphics, and that's exactly their purpose, allowing two starships to dock in orbit for propellant transfer. This capability is essential for enabling lunar missions and deep space exploration. Even though Starship is enormous and carries an immense amount of propellant, most of that fuel is used just to escape Earth's gravity. Orbital refueling makes it possible to complete the remaining approximately 400,000 kilometer, about 250,000 mile, journey to the moon, or go even farther, all the way to Mars. Other visible updates include repositioned Starlink terminals, an updated catch pin design, and several changes to internal welds. The new docking ports are now clearly visible, and the heat shield features a more refined, tapered edge around the vehicle. Notably, Starship no longer uses traditional lift points. Instead, it relies entirely on the catch pin and stabilizer points for ground handling. But the upgrades don't stop there. Starship V3 also introduces new protective covers for the COPV tanks, composite overwrapped pressure vessels. While COPVs are extremely strong and lightweight, they can still be damaged during handling if dropped or struck. To address this, SpaceX has added orange metal jacketing, a segmented shell with foam padding underneath to absorb impacts and protect the tanks. Without exaggeration, one of the most important upgrades in Starship Block 3 is the Raptor 3 engine. On December 3rd, SpaceX released a stunning video showing Raptor 3 running for over six minutes, simulating a full ascent burn. For the first time, we get an extended, uninterrupted look at this remarkable engine in operation. As the test progresses, you can see ice forming on the powerhead. This happens because Raptor 3 uses active external cooling. SpaceX's idea is simple but clever. If the engine is actively cooled on the outside, it no longer needs heavy shielding. Eliminating that shielding saves mass, a fascinating design choice to see working in real time. In terms of performance, Raptor 3 is an absolute beast.
Each engine produces roughly 280 tons of thrust at sea level, with a specific impulse of about 350 seconds, and weighs around 1,525 kilograms, or about 1,720 kilograms when all vehicle-side hardware is included. And SpaceX isn't stopping there. According to Elon Musk, the goal is to reach 300 tons of thrust per engine. If achieved, a fully loaded Super Heavy booster with 33 Raptors would generate an astonishing 10,000 tons of thrust at liftoff. With all that information in mind, the big question is, when could the first V3 flight realistically happen? So far, SpaceX has said that Starship's 12th flight test is targeted for the first quarter of 2026. But can we refine that estimate a bit? To get there, several elements need to be ready. The Massey facility for cryogenic and static fire testing, Pad 2, 39 flight-ready Raptor V3 engines, Booster 19, and Ship 39. Based on current observations and speculation, some of the most optimistic guesses place the first flight as early as late January, around January 26th. A more realistic estimate points to February 2026. For the first V3, a couple of months of build time will likely be needed before the vehicle is ready for pressure and cryogenic tests. Massey should be prepared by then, and commissioning time for V3 engines may not be extensive. After that, a month might be required for Ship 39 to complete static fire testing, especially if the static fire stand at Massey needs commissioning with the ship itself. Following that, it could take a couple of weeks before Ship 39 is fully ready for launch. As for Booster 19 and Pad 2 commissioning, timelines are less certain, but they could align with a similar overall timeframe. SpaceX will likely want to observe the results of Flight 12 before finalizing work on Ship 40 and Booster 20. This could result in a six to eight week gap between Flight 12 and Flight 13, with launch intervals potentially shrinking to around three weeks afterward, assuming no mishaps or investigations intervene. Starship V3 is without a doubt a wild beast, completely different from anything we've seen before. Preparing for this vehicle has naturally taken time to adjust all the systems. It might encounter issues on the test stand, and it might even fail on its first flight, but that's the essence of space exploration. If we truly want to take the next step, we have to step out of the safe bubble and venture into the unknown, trying things that, just a few years ago, would have seemed impossible.